In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space and ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us, to bind us to our Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and work of ours may begin with you and through you be happily completed through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And welcome. Um, it's great to see so many people here. And uh, I want to welcome the Newman Center students. How many of you are here? All right, good number. Um, so it's their fault that we didn't have enough chairs, so people know. Um, OK, so what I'm Father Kilcally, and I'm the director of the Family Life and Evangelization Office here in the Diocese of Lincoln. And, um, and so tonight, I want to just kind of give you an introduction to this course and what we'll be doing over the next 12 weeks, uh, kind of give some background for why, um, why it means a lot to me. Uh, to both present this and for you to be here to learn more about John Paul II's teaching on human love in the divine plan. And we'll see if my computer works. Um, so I decided to do this class. I'm going to just click on this until it works. Excuse me. Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> We're going. I apologize. There we go. Okay, so the, one of the reasons that I decided to teach this class was that in my own priesthood, John Paul II's teaching on love has had a huge impact on me in my own understanding of my vocation as a celibate man living virginity for the sake of the kingdom of God. And I was first introduced to it when I was a deacon at Cathedral. And that year I had given a homily on some aspects of Theology of the Body, and there was a parishioner who came up to me, and she said to me, that was a great Theology of the Body homily. You should teach a class. And I was a deacon, and I thought to myself, well, I got nothing else to do. So I went to Monsignor Tucker and asked his permission, and that was the first time that I'd read through all of the Wednesday audiences that John Paul II gave over a five-year period and really fell in love with that teaching. And since then, it's really formed everything that I've done in my priesthood. When I was a young, uh, when I was a newly ordained priest, I taught at Pius, and I incorporated this mini unit in Theology of the Body in junior year. And there was a girl in my class who was planning to come to the first day, get my permission to drop religion, and then transfer to East. And after this first lesson on love, she came up to me afterwards and she said, okay, Father, I changed my mind. I'm going to stay in your class. And like that started to form a relationship with her that has lasted until now. She's actually one of my spiritual directees today. Then I graduated from junior year to senior year religion at Pius, and I took the vocations class that I was giving, and I just made the whole thing a uh, theology to body class. And a lot of my students really held on to the principles that they learned there. Some of them became focused missionaries and I saw them a few years later, and they came up to me, and they were like, Father, your notes are helping so much in my Bible study. And, and so that's all been really amazing to see how that's played out. Right now, there's a particular reason that I decided to do this course, and this isn't going to work very well. When John Paul II gave these audiences, the first audience was given September 5th, 1979. And in that audience, John Paul II makes reference to the upcoming Synod of Bishops that would study the topic, the role of the Christian family. So in 1979, John Paul II started this catechesis. And he did it. I'm sorry about my computer. I'm going to have to shut this thing down. He did it because... All the bishops of the world were about to gather to discuss the role of the Christian family in the modern world. And then later, they produced a document called Familiaris Consortio. And Familiaris Consortio is the document on the family. So I thought it was interesting that the context to start these presentations was that upcoming synod on the family. And we find ourselves today right in the middle of this synod on the family. 
where Pope Francis has asked all the bishops of the world to reflect on the church's teaching on marriage and human sexuality. And I'm going to take a break for a second, and I'm going to turn that off. It's not going to work. Okay. And that synod that we're preparing for right now is dealing with these kind of pastoral challenges like ruptured families, divorced and remarried Catholics, the issue of gender identity and how we treat homosexual persons. And as we've all been following the media over the last year, year and a half, there's all kinds of dialogue about these topics. Pope Francis is going to change the church's teaching on divorce and remarriage, or the church is going to change their position on homosexual persons. Here in Lincoln last year, we had this whole series of articles in the paper about gender identity and how we understand gender identity. And all of those issues are issues that require a deeper response than we're used to giving in a soundbite. So my hope is that over this next 12 weeks, we have a chance to reflect more deeply on the teaching of the church on marriage and family, but more profoundly on the teaching of the church on what it means to be a human being, what it means to love, what it means to be created in the image of God. What's the most fundamental thing about being a human person? Because the most fundamental thing about being a human person has to do more with our relationship with God than it has to do with our attractions or our behaviors or our sexual activity. And we'll see in today's reflections and from the first seven catechesis that what John Paul II wants to do is to go underneath all of those kind of controversial questions to get at the core. So in the opening catechesis, John Paul II makes this point that Christ points us back to the beginning. And he starts with Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 8. And so the Pharisees approach Jesus, and they ask him this question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason whatsoever? Jesus says to him in reply, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite to his wife, and the two will become one flesh? So it is that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined, let man not separate. They objected, Why then did Moses order to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus answered, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. And so Christ does not accept the discussion on the level on which his interlocutors try to introduce it. In a sense, he doesn't approve the dimension that they tried to give to the problem. So when they go to Jesus, what they're trying to do is make everything about the law and to make everything about legalism. So they go to him and they say, is it lawful to divorce for any reason? Jesus says, no, from the beginning it was not so. Well, Moses allowed for divorce and then Jesus comes back and says, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But again, from the beginning, it was not so. So twice in his answer, Jesus points them back to the beginning. And the beginning signifies, therefore, what the book of Genesis speaks about. And so John Paul II is going to go from this quote from Jesus back to the beginning in order to reflect on the unity and indissolubility of marriage. And this is going to give us the structure for the way that we go through these audiences So when we think about salvation history, lots of you have seen me do this a bunch of times. It goes something like this. God creates the world and everything is good. Then something happens called original sin. 
and things become, after original sin, I'm going to say distorted. When I ask my students this, they'll often say things like, things became bad, things became evil, but really things become distorted. Because distorted means that you can still tell what it's supposed to be, it's just not clear. Right? So when I teach this to high school kids, I have to explain like antenna TV. Right? Like when we were growing up and we had an antenna TV, we had to point the TV towards the TV signal. And where I grew up, we couldn't get the reception from three hours away in Kalamazoo. So I grew up a Lions fan. Boo. <laughs> and the Detroit Lions have never been good at football. So as I was growing up, the home games were always blacked out from the Detroit stations, and we lived about an hour outside Detroit. So we had to turn the anten antenna towards Kalamazoo, three hours away, and you just saw a fuzzy picture, guys running back and forth. That was it. So I could still tell what was going on in the game, but it wasn't clear. Right? And that's kind of what happens to us after original sin. After original sin, you can still tell what love is supposed to be, but it's just not clear. Or you can tell what the family is supposed to be, it's just not clear. Right here, the family is a husband and wife and their natural children. You know, after original sin, the family that we see in the Old Testament is Jacob's family. Jacob goes off and he falls in love with Rachel, and he goes to Rachel's dad and asks permission to marry her. And the dad says, "Yes, go to that tent tonight." He goes to that tent, consummates the marriage, wakes up the next morning, ah, wrong sister. And then he goes to. Laban, the father, and he says, you tricked me into marrying the wrong sister. And he says, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Just work another seven years, and then you can marry Rachel. So he stays another seven years, marries Rachel. She can't have babies. She gets jealous because Leah has babies. So she says, take my concubine and have babies with my concubine. Leah gets jealous of Rachel, says, take my concubine, have babies with my concubine. And then you've got one dad, four moms, 12 brothers who all hate each other and throw Joseph in the cistern. Right? It's like the family I grew up in. <laughs> right? But it's still a family. It's a distorted family. And then the next thing that happens is Christ enters into the world. And he enters into that family. Okay? And this is one of my major themes. Okay? This isn't what John Paul II says. It's just a major theme of my own pastoral ministry that I think is important to keep in mind when we talk about those families where there's divorce or where there's gender identity confusion, or where things just aren't the way they're supposed to be. That when Christ entered the world, he didn't simply enter into the holy family of Nazareth as if it was separated from the rest of history. In Matthew's gospel, in the first chapter, Matthew starts with Abraham as the father of Isaac, as the father of Jacob. And he goes through all those generations, right? And he names off all these generations of people. And in those generations of people, we see people like Tamar, who was married to one of Judah's sons, and then he died. Then she married his other son, and then he died. And then Judah said, you go off and be a widow, and I'll send my third son when he's old enough. But Judah never did. And so Tamar's feeling all insecure, and she goes and tricks Judah into sleeping with her, because she dresses up like a prostitute. And then she gets pregnant by Judah, her father-in-law, and then shows up with a baby and says, ha, now you have to take care of me. Right? Not the holy family of Nazareth. And then it names Rahab the harlot who helps the Hebrew people take the city of Jericho. And then it names Ruth, who's not a member of the people of God. And then it names Bathsheba. But it doesn't even name her by name. It says, David married the wife of Uriah. Because right? David seduced Bathsheba and then had her husband killed. Right? Not the holy family of Nazareth. But at the end of that long genealogy, it says, and then was born Jesus. Which means that Jesus entered into that whole family in order to redeem it and bring clarity to it so that we could all eventually be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven. Right? That's the gospel. And these constitute moments in salvation history that John Paul II will use to talk about what love is. And so this first set of talks, he talks about original man, which 
is that time period between creation and original sin. So when Jesus says, go back to the beginning, he's talking about going back to that period of time to reflect on how things were meant to be. And then he's going to use this term, historical man. And historical man constitutes that period of history after original sin. He'll say in the audience is the period of historical sinfulness, where everything was distorted and then Christ enters in in order to bring about redemption. And so we have redeemed man. so that eventually we can all get into reach the kingdom of heaven. And he's going to give a whole series of talks called Eschatological Man. Which reflect on our destiny as human persons. And in that section, we'll reflect on how we're created to be in the kingdom of heaven. And so in this first audiences, Jesus points out that we have to go back to the beginning. So the phrase, let man not separate, what God has joined together, let man not separate, is decisive. In the light of this word of Christ, Genesis 2.24 states the principle of unity and indissolubility of marriage as the very content of the word of God expressed in the most ancient revelation. That line is probably the most important line when it comes to all of the debate in the church right now about what we're going to do about marriage. Because it's Jesus himself who says that from the beginning it was not so. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery or causes her to commit adultery. It's Jesus who says that marriage is a bond between one man and one woman that can only be broken by death. And so when this comes up in debate, it's important for us to remember, and Pope Benedict pointed this out very very clearly, as did John Paul II, that it's not in the church's authority to change Jesus' teaching. Like, I can't decide, well, Jesus didn't really mean that. I'm going to reinterpret what he said. John Paul II uses the word normative a lot in the audiences. He says that these words are normative or this word is decisive. And so when we talk about pastoral approaches or when we talk about families in difficulty, We always have to talk about that within this context of the decisive word of Christ. He says the goal of these audiences is accompanying, so to speak, from afar the work in preparation for the synod. Not, however, by directly teaching the topic, but by turning attention to the deep roots from which this topic springs. So what our Holy Father says is he's going to do all of these audiences. There's 129 Wednesday audiences that he gave on human love and the divine plan over a five-year period. Right in the middle, he got shot. And so there's about a year that he took off there and then finished them. But the goal is to accompany the synod in their preparation. And I think it's important for us to remember this, that he says it's not by directly touching on the topic but by turning attention to the deep roots from which this topic springs. So in our own reflection on our own lives, on these issues, on marriage, family, human sexuality, how do I answer my kids' questions about sex? How do I talk to my kids about sex? How do I teach my students about sex? We have to pay attention to the deep roots from which those questions spring. And the deeper root is what does it mean to be a human being? Who am I? in the image of God. What does it really mean to be created in the image of God? All right, so again, everything is framed on this timeline. There's original man, historical man, fallen and redeemed, and eschatological man. So when we go back to the beginning, there's two accounts of creation. 
Matthew 19.4 says, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female? Which corresponds to Genesis 1 through Genesis 2.4. Right? That first story of creation. Right? Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then God said, let there be plants. And there were plants, etc., etc., etc. And at the end of which, it constantly says, and it was very good. Then Jesus said, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to, the wife, to his wife, and the two become one body, which corresponds to Genesis 2.24. So in our Lord's answer to the Pharisees, he takes both these stories from Genesis and kind of combines them. So when he refers back to the beginning, he refers both to Genesis chapter 1 and everything that Genesis chapter 1 says about creation, and he also refers to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 is the more ancient story of creation. So scholars say Genesis chapter 2 is the Yahwist account. Right? So if you read along in the audiences, he always calls this the Yahwist account of creation because in that chapter 2 and 3 of Genesis, God is called Yahweh. The characteristic of Genesis 2 is that there, it's more anthropomorphic, which means God is sort of described as if he's a human being or as if he's a man. We attribute human attributes to God. So when we have the story of Adam's creation in Genesis 2, it's the story of how God formed him out of the dust and blew life into his nostrils. Genesis 1 is chronologically more recent. John Paul II says that it's more, it's more mature both with regard to the image of God and in the formulation of the essential truths about man. Okay. It's also just more simple. Right? Genesis 127, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So we'll reflect a little bit more on Genesis 1. Genesis 1 does not speak of man's likeness to creation, but of his likeness to God. Which is interesting. Because as God creates everything in Genesis chapter 1, you have this progression, right? God created light. He separated the heavens from the earth. He made all of the green plants grow on the earth. He then created animal life. And then he creates man. And so there's this progression that happens as we go forward. But when it talks about man, it says that man is created in the image of God, not man is just a really special animal. You know, that's what we believe as Catholic Christians. Right? That we're more like God than like the animals, which seems like an elementary point. Yet, it's probably one of the things that people bring up most of all when they try to justify behaviors, especially sexual behaviors in our society, right? Like we're just like the animals. And then they'll use these examples. Like one of, some of my high school students used to talk to me about gay penguins and things like that. But we're not a penguin, even if there is. I don't even know how you would tell. So... <laughs> But we do do that. You know, we'll talk about monkeys and things like that. But we're human beings. We are not like the animals. Right? The Creator actually seems to halt before calling man to existence as if he entered back into himself to make a decision. He says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So when we read through that section in the first chapter of Genesis... In all of the other sections, it sort of says, God said, let us make the animals and everything that walks on the ground. Then he did, and it was very good. With man, there's a sort of prolonged story of creation there. And he says it's as if the creator sort of stops before to think about what he's doing. I always sort of think of it as an artist who's painting a painting, and they kind of have everything in place. And they're about to put the finishing touch on this painting that's going to make it their masterpiece. And they sort of just step back and take in that moment. 
in order to make sure that everything that they do will bring it to glory and perfection. And that's what God did when he created us. And we are defined by our likeness to God. He says the first account is concise, free from any trace of subjectivism. It contains only the objective fact and defines the objective reality. But when it speaks about the creation of the human being, male and female, in the image of God, and when it adds a little later the words and when it adds a little later the words of the first blessing. Right? So Genesis chapter one is speaking about an objective reality. That's what it says. We're created in the image of God, male and female. And then God speaks this word of blessing, and it was very good. And then he says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And it's here that we recognize that simply being and goodness are convertible terms theologically. Right? Because God created us, we're very good. Which means our default is we're very good. And God's intention when he created us was that we're very good. Right? This is a truth that we need to speak into the hearts of our young people and into the hearts of our society, into the hearts of our neighbors. Because so many of us, when we reflect on our own lives, this story that we have here, this story of creation, God created the world and everything was good. Then something happened, things became distorted. That matches up with my life. And it matches up with your life. We were all born into a world where everything was good. At a minimum, in utero, everything was good. <coughs> then something happened. You know, in my own life, then something happened. My mom had cancer when she was pregnant with me. I was born into a world, everything was good. She was going to doctor's appointments. By the time I was two years old, she had died. Then I grew up in a family where there was alcoholism on both sides. And so I grew up with some distorted realities. Then when I was in seventh grade, the neighbor kid used to rub my face in the snow at the bus stop. Right? You, nobody even laughs at that. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's horrible. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Right? That's also something that happened to me that caused a distortion about who I am, about who God is, about the relationships between men and women. Right? Today, first exposure to internet pornography is at age 11, maybe 10, maybe 9. That's something that happens in the life of young people that causes a distortion. Right? The television that kids watch where Sex and sexuality are portrayed as a recreational event, right? Many of the teen shows that are geared towards teenagers today, kind of the narrative goes like this. 15-year-old girl falls in love with 17-year-old boy. They go sleep together. Mom accidentally walks in. Oh, I'm so sorry. Next morning, mom's like, hey, how was it? Right? That causes a distortion about sex and sexuality and what's normal. You know, being exposed to that causes this kind of distortion. <laughs> But then the good news of redemption is what? Jesus enters into my distorted life in order to bring me to clarity. And our Lord came to redeem us. And so this affirmation that God created us very good is important. Why? Because sometimes this thing that happened in our life was so bad that it's all we see is my sin from the past. So many people have this idea that I'm defective. There's something wrong with me. God made me this way. God made me broken. But underneath that thing that happened, there's this reality that you're created very good. And so when we look at this theologically, what is John Paul II doing? He's going back behind original sin to talk about God's plan from the beginning and affirm the fact that human beings were created very good. Genesis 2 tells a different story of creation. One can say that 
This depth is above all subjective in nature and thus in some way psychological. So when we look at the second story of creation, it reads more like a psychological narrative and it kind of explains the whys of being created male and female. So Genesis chapter one is just the objective facts. Genesis chapter two sort of explains what that means to be created male and female. When Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, he started with the first account, then moved to the second. And his words directly describe the unity and indissolubility of marriage. Christ links back to the beginning, but leads us to the boundary. So what's interesting when we look at Christ pointing back to, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two become one flesh. And they were both naked, but not ashamed. And so he points to this boundary experience. And by a boundary experience, he means an experience that happens right here between two different phases. It's a boundary experience. It's something that touches both our original goodness, original integrity, and it touches on that original sin. Or it touches on that distortion. And so that line right after, they were both naked but not ashamed, points to this reality of shame that will become a big theme as we unpack how sin has caused a disruption or distortion in our lives. Right? Genesis 2.24 was, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and joins to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Genesis 2.25, and they were both naked but not ashamed. And then immediately it moves into Genesis 3 and the fall of man, right? And what happens after that distortion. So we see here the distinction between original innocence and the state of man's sinfulness or the state of integral nature and fallen nature. Okay, so when he talks about integral nature, to be integrated means that everything sort of works together, right? My body and soul work together. There's no division in me. Sometimes when we've had a lot of experiences with sin, or even when sins have been committed against us, it creates like a split between our interior and our exterior life. And we start to experience ourselves that way, and we'll say things like, well, my body wants to sin, but my heart is good. I remember justifying a lot of sins like that. <laughs> right? I'm only sinning with my body, but my soul is pure. Right? Which is not what we believe about a human being. Right? Human beings are body, soul, composite. But a lot of us and a lot of people in our culture fall into that area of splitting body from soul and saying things like, you know, I'm only hurting my body, I'm not hurting my spirit. And so original integrity means that the body reveals the person. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. The state of sinfulness is when there starts to be shame where my body is separate from who I am as a person. Christ's words also point to the redemption of the body. So Christ's response points us back to beyond the boundary running in Genesis between the state of original innocence and, origin and the state of sinfulness. His words allow us to find an essential continuity in man and a link between these two different states or dimensions of the human being. Okay, so again, he points back here to show the continuity between the way we were created and what we were created for and the rest of our lives. And so how we can put this into practice very easily in our own lives. You know, whenever people ask us those difficult questions, you know, when somebody comes up and asks the question, why can't divorced and remarried people go to communion? Or what's really wrong with a homosexual union okay, I'm going to go back before that distortion and talk about how we were created to be in the image and likeness of God first. 
and we're going to focus everything back here. Because if we immediately start to address the question, we get all tangled up. And the clarity comes in going back to the beginning. Because fundamentally, there's something more to talk about than the states of sin or the state of confusion. The state of sin is part of historical man, but it also plunges its roots deeply into its theological prehistory. Right? The way that we experience the state of sin or that distorted life does have its roots in what is good. And we can still see glimpses of what is good. Every point of our historical sinfulness must be explained with reference to original innocence. So when we talk about what's corrupt in man or what's corrupt in human relationships, or when we, even when we talk about sin, we should always talk to about it with reference to what is good. And how many times do we actually do that? Because I know for me, when I was teaching in high school, when people would ask me those difficult questions, like, what's wrong with homosexual unions? My tendency would be to say that, well, God created us to, for procreation, sex is for procreation, so two people of the same sex can't procreate, therefore it's against nature, and it's sinful. What did I not do? I didn't go back to reaffirm the fact that every single person who experiences same-sex attraction is created in the image of God. And start there to move forward. When we talk about difficulties in family life and we say, well, your family shouldn't be this way, it should be this way. Don't do that, do this. We have to go back to point out how was it supposed to be from the beginning? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? Right? Why is contraception immoral? Because you have to be open to life all the time. Da, 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 da. Well, the church just wants me to have as many babies as possible. That's how you get in that dialogue where, well, the church just wants me to have as many babies as possible. That's all they care about. Or you get into the dialogue of, you can only have sex when you want to have a baby. Or you get into the dialogue of, well, NFP is really just Catholic contraception because they're both avoiding. Or you get into the dialogue of NFP is really sinful because you should be open to as many babies as possible. All of those dialogues happen. They kind of exist on all ends of the spectrum. But what do we have to do? We have to go back to say, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? And what is love meant to be from the beginning? In order to provide a context for the conclusions that we have, so many times we start with the conclusions. Pope Francis constantly talks about enjoy the gospel, that we have these three stages of catechesis, basically. You have this first proclamation of Christ's saving love, and then catechesis, and then doctrinal and moral conclusions. He says, a good homily always should start with the first proclamation of Christ's saving love. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross to save you. He died on the cross to save you, not just the mass of humanity but you in particular. Our Lord wants to enter into your life. He walks with you to accompany you in all aspects of your life. And then you move to catechesis. Okay, what do we conclude from that? And these are things like we learn the seven sacraments, we learn the Ten Commandments, we learn the teaching of the church. And then you move to doctrinal and moral conclusions like any act which separates the unitive and procreative dimensions, the marital act is immoral. But oftentimes, Pope Francis says, the order is reversed. The opposite order is prevailing. Where we start off with, you're a sinner. Don't do that action, do this action. And when we start with, don't do that, do this, without first proclaiming God's love, like, what's my motivation to change my life? Because then the gospel easily becomes converted into this sort of set of standards that I have to achieve, and if I achieve those standards, then God will reward me at the end of my life. I call it the gospel of the suck. The gospel of the suck is... God created the world, and then there was original sin, and so life sucks. 
if you persevere in the suck and you're always faithful in the suck, then at the end of your life, God will give you a big reward and then you can be happy and have joy. Yes, I want to be a Christian. (laughs) So many of us have heard that though. You know, whenever we have suffering in our life, people will say something like, well, God just created you to suffer. You're just supposed to suffer. And then I think, what? God created me to suffer. That's not what John Paul II is talking about. He says God created you good, and then something happened, which led to suffering. And then something else happened, which can bring joy. That's the gospel. And so this is what he's trying to do by pointing us back to the beginning is to give us a clear groundwork of God's intention for our lives. And that beginning also is our beginning. God's intention for each and every one of you is that everything was good. His intention for each and every one of you is to speak blessing into your life. His intention for each and every one of you is to be able to see that you are loved first before anything ever happened that could cause a distortion. And the deeper we reflect on that, the more we start to see it in clarity. Every point of our historical sinfulness must be explained with the reference to original innocence. Even as we identify with historical sinfulness, we also participate in the history of redemption. Right. So even as, and this is kind of, sums up what I was just saying. Even as we participate in historical sinfulness, as we still suffer with our own sin, we're called to participate in the story of salvation and redemption. You know, that's what we're ordered towards. St. Paul says we groan inwardly while we wait for the redemption of our bodies. So even St. Paul talks about this inward groaning as I await the redemption of my body. This sort of tension I feel because I live in this state of historical sinfulness. And this also is important for us to recognize because we do all find ourselves somewhere on this path of salvation history. If we're honest, most of us kind of live right about here. Because the cross is kind of a scary thing in our lives. You know, this life of redemption is the life I'm in the state of grace. I'm experiencing God's love in my life on a regular basis. I'm receiving our Lord in the Eucharist. But we tend to oscillate between here and here. You know, this is perfect sanctity. Most of us, if we're honest, we just kind of oscillate from here and here and we kind of toy. Sometimes we want to just jump over the cross and go here. Right? These are people who are like, when on this retreat, I had an amazing experience and now I'm holy. <laughs> yes. I didn't even have to suffer. I don't even know what they even, Jesus said, take up your cross, but I didn't have to. It just jumped it over. It. Right? We can fall into that very easily. I can fall into it. In the interpretation of the revelation about man, and above all about the body, we must, for understandable reasons, appeal to experience because bodily man is perceived by us, above all, in experience. So as we reflect on this, John Paul II says part of his method is to reflect on theology through the lens of experience or through the lens of human experience. And so for each of us, as we're studying this material over the next 12 weeks, it's a time for us to reflect on our own experience. It's a time for us to reflect on the fact that, like, am I really aware that I was created good? How do I experience myself as a human being? In this first section of Theology of the Body, John Paul II talks about three original experiences. And an original experience it means that there's something I experience for the first time and I have absolutely no context for what I'm experiencing. Okay, it's something brand new. Right? It's like the first time you go to the Grand Canyon and you step out and you take in the Grand Canyon and all its magnitude and it just strikes you. 
Have any, have any, has anybody ever had that? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I went to the Grand Canyon when I was a seminarian, and I hate nature. <laughs> just hate nature. I would never go see nature. And a friend of mine was going to Grand Canyon, and I had a choice of sitting around doing nothing or go to the Grand Canyon. So I went to the Grand Canyon. And I'm thinking to myself, it's just this big hole in the ground, and you know, we're going to go there, and I'll walk up, and it'll be like, okay, saw that. Let's go get drinks. <laughs> and I just remember walking up to the edge of the Grand Canyon and taking it in and being like, wow, this is incredibly beautiful. And I, couldn't, I could never have imagined what it would be like before I got there. Right? So it was an original experience, right? something that touched my affect in a way for the first time. And so there's three original experiences right, that are fundamental to who we are as human beings. And the first one is original solitude, which comes from this verse from Genesis where God says about the man, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a suitable helpmate. Okay, it refers to man as such, not only to the male. So in this second chapter of Genesis, God creates Adam first, right? He creates him out of the dust and blows air into his nostrils. And then Adam spends this time on the earth as the only human being on the earth. And he's called Adam in Hebrew. Later, when God forms Eve from his rib, he talks about them being male and female. So the words used in the scriptures are different. He, they use the word ish for male and isha for female. And so because it says it's not good for the man, Adam, to be alone, it refers to human beings as such. It refers to all of us, each and every one of us, male and female. And this idea of loneliness has two meanings. Okay, one derives from our very nature as human beings, right? Our very nature as human beings is that we're created in this state of solitude. And the second derives from the relationship between the male and the female. Okay, so when we talk about original loneliness, original solitude, John Paul II has this sort of double meaning of it. The first meaning is that by our very nature, we're created for relationship and we find ourselves to be the only being on the planet created for relationship. So it has to do with our solitude with God. The second has to do with the fact that there's this loneliness without the woman or for the woman, there's this loneliness without the man. John Paul II says, in Adam's loneliness, he discovers his identity and he discovers that he's superior to other creatures. So when we think about what that means and what it means that this is an original experience, we have to sort of put ourselves in Adam's shoes. And so God has created the entire world and then he creates Adam from the dust, breathes life into him, and then he has the ability to experience everything around him. And he experiences everything around him as if for the first time. And so he goes and he sees a rock. And he recognizes that this is a material thing. It doesn't grow. It just sort of sits there. And he also recognizes that I am not a rock. Okay, that's what he realizes. So he's starting to learn his own identity when he encounters everything else. So then he sees a tree. And he recognizes that this plant life can grow, but it can't move around. I can move around. This can't move around. I can talk. This can't talk. I'm not a tree. And he experiences this about everything on the planet. And he also has this job of tilling the garden and making it fruitful. Okay, which shows his superiority over all of material creation. And so in that, he starts to discover who he is. And he finds himself before God in search of his identity. He's alone because he's different from the world. Right? That's how he figures out who he is. And so in many ways, 
His identity is revealed to him through his experience of the world around him. Right? And our own lives aren't much different from that. You know, we learn our identity from our experience of the people and the things around us. Right? We identify with our family members. Right? I remember when I was a kid, you know, especially old people used to do this a lot. I don't know if people still do this. If you don't, you should. Right? So I would meet relatives and they would always say to me, oh, you have your mom's smile. You, know, you have your dad's eyes. I remember once my younger sister who has blue eyes, and I have blue eyes, and she got to be, I think she was probably like five years old, and she was like, I'm like you. Because we were the only ones in the family who had blue eyes. And she started to identify based on like, am I like this person or not like this person? You know, it's how we learn who we are. We learn who we are through relationships with other people. We learn who we are and people tell us who we are. And it's just so important. And Adam has this experience. So as he goes around and he discovers, I'm not like the rocks, I'm not like the plant life. When God brings him the animal life, he realizes I'm not like this animal life. And he has to come to the conclusion that I'm like God. And that's this experience of original solitude. Because he's different from everything else, he realizes he's like God. That's his default. And it's important that that's his default. Why? Because he realizes that he's not like the animals. He doesn't say, I'm like the ape except I have more logic. He says, I'm not like that, I'm like God. And he has the ability to name all of the different creatures. And so he starts to develop this self-consciousness and self-determination. Okay, self-consciousness means like he's starting to discover who he is. He's discovering what his identity is. And self-determination is as he recognizes that he has the ability to act and to exercise his free will. He's the subject of the covenant and partner of the absolute. So the first covenant that God makes with his people is with Adam in the beginning. And the covenant's just an unspoken covenant. The covenant's formed by virtue of the fact that God created him. Because God created him, he's in relationship with God. And who's the initiator of that relationship? God. How important is that for evangelization? And because God created you, there's automatically a relationship. And it's God who formed the relationship. And that first covenant is marked by the command to eat of all the fruit of the trees of the garden except for the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So man is alone, but he is set into a unique, exclusive, and unrepeatable relationship with God himself. Right? Unique, exclusive, and unrepeatable. Each and every one of you we're created to be in a unique, exclusive, and unrepeatable relationship with God. John Paul II says, based on his body, he could have determined that he was similar to other living beings. Rather, he reached the conviction that he was alone. Right? He didn't say, I'm like the apes, or the dog, or the platypus, but I'm like God. Man alone can rule the earth, can cultivate and transform it according to his own needs. So the structure of the body is such that it permits him to be the author of genuinely human activity. In this activity, the body expresses the person. It is thus in all its materiality, because the body was formed from the dust of the ground, it's penetrable and transparent as it were, in such a way as to make it clear who man is and who he ought to be, thanks to the structure of his consciousness and self-determination. 
So what he's getting at is in this state of original solitude, Adam's body reveals to him who he is. Because it's through his body that he comes into contact with everything else on the earth. And it's his body that shows him that he is different from everything else on the earth. And he uses these adjectives that his body is penetrable and transparent. That he's able to express who he is in his fullness through his body. And when we think about that, we know some people who are fairly transparent. And I think all of us know people who aren't very transparent. Like we've all met people where you kind of meet them and you're like, eh, I don't really know about that guy. I don't really know if they're the real deal. Sometimes people are really people pleasing and they always tell you what to do and they flatter you a lot and they're like, hey, everything's good, joyful. And I don't really know. I had this friend and uh, sometimes people are actually genuine but they seem that way. So I had this friend, Noble Gibbons, when I was at West Point and he was a Christian and uh, he was this guy who like, he would walk around campus and you'd be like, hey, how's it going? You'd be like, praise God. Every time you met him, that's all he would say. What'd you have for dinner? Praise God! Pizza. It was awesome. <laughs> He's the praise God guy. And, uh, <laughs> but I think, honestly, he was that joyful. It just took me a while to get used to him. Because <laughs> I always kind of was like, ah, I don't really know if he's the real deal. I had to kind of put up some boundaries with him. But in the beginning, there was no reason to hide. And so, like, Adam's body fully reveals who he is and expresses himself through his body. All of us express ourselves through our body. And we have a particular body language. You know, we talk about body language all the time. That sometimes when I talk to people, they stare at the ground the entire time and they won't look at me. Which tells me something about them. It tells me that they're afraid of me. It tells me that they don't want to, me to know who they are. Or they're ashamed. Sometimes people are over-aggressive in their posture. Right? Like sometimes, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use too many examples. because Hardly any of you meet with me. So. <laughs> so, like, sometimes people will come in. I remember one time I had a meeting with somebody in my office. And they come in, and it was the first time this ever happened. So I've got my desk there. And they just, like, pulled up to my desk and put their elbows on my desk leaning towards me. I was like, whoa, they're taking charge. And what did that tell me? It told me, like, they want to be in charge, and they want to make sure that they control the narrative of our conversation. We use, our, we use body language all the time. Our bodies reveal who we are. And so, in the beginning, all that was shown forth was exactly who Adam was. Placed before the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there's a question of the alternative between death and immortality. So John Paul II talks about this dynamic of giving Adam the command. You can eat of all the fruit of the garden except for the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it or even touch it or you'll die. And so he reflects more on that experience of what that would have been like for somebody who doesn't know what death is to hear this idea that you could die. And this was also where Adam has the opportunity to exercise his free will and to determine who he is. The words you shall die signify that there's a dependence in existing so that they show man as a limited being and by his nature susceptible to non-existence. Right? They reveal that there's a dependence on the part of man that all of us have to depend entirely on our Lord and that that creation in the beginning and original solitude is creation into this state of being where I'm dependent on God and I experience myself as like Him. But I have to use my free will to stay in that relationship. Because otherwise, it's possible that there could be death or I'm limited and I'm susceptible to not exist. 
or to go out of existence. And so that's a basic summary of what original solitude is. And I want to, for a moment, just put this in the context of some of the writings of Pope Benedict XVI. Because I found that Pope Benedict XVI's reflections on love in Deus Caritas Est really kind of added to or supplemented or unpacked much of what John Paul II wrote in the Theology of the Body audiences. And so Benedict XVI, when he talks about being created in the image of God, he really focuses on the fact that we're created in the image of the triune God. All right, John Paul II alludes to this in a minor way in one of the audiences, but he doesn't really very forwardly say that man and woman are the image of the Trinity together, but he sort of alludes to it. Benedict XVI talks about this creation in the image of the Trinity in a particular way that follows this sort of unpacking of the original experiences that we'll do um, also coming up next week. So when we talk about the image of God, God is a trinity of persons. Some of you who have seen me have seen this many times. All right, so you have three persons in one God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I could ask you, what is it that makes one of those persons different than the other? And you'd say, the Father's more powerful. Yes? No. Right? Which one's more powerful? None of them. Which one has more glory? None of them. Which one has more majesty? None of them. Right? What makes the three persons of the Trinity distinct is their relationship. Right? So this is a particular relationship that we call fatherhood. I apologize if you're in the back. And fatherhood is characterized by this kind of love that is gift. Okay, when we go through next week and we talk about original unity, we'll talk about this ethos of the gift or gift love that John Paul II talks about a lot. But the Father's love is gift love. So in our own human experience, we know that the way a parent loves their children is that they would give everything they are to their child. They would sacrifice everything they have for their child. That mothers are often the last ones to take food at the table at dinner. You know, I have friends and I go to their house and sort of, the kids are all out of the house, but the mom, she still like serves everybody else dinner and then she kind of like nibbles on chips because that's the way she ate for many, many years because she was always the last one to eat because she's one to sacrifice for her children. If I put words on that gift love, I'm going to say it's the kind of love that says, I want the good for you. Right? I want what is good for you. I'm willing to sacrifice my own life because I want what is good for you. Then there's this kind of love that goes from the son to the father. That we'll call sonship. And so sonship love According to St. Thomas, it has to be completely different from fatherhood love. It can't be the same. So oftentimes we could say things like, the father gives and the son gives back. But I don't like saying it that way because if we say the father gives, the son gives, then they're both doing the same thing. And then the son becomes the father and it gets really confusing. Right? When we get a gift, what do we do? open it up, and then I decide if I'm going to keep it. <laughs> if you're really holy, you say thank you. Good job. Like when you have your school secret Santas, you give one gift, you expect? What? None. Rose says none. You give one gift, you expect one gift back, right? 
So you go to your secret Santa, you give one gift, you get one gift back, and then there's like the lady who works in the classroom next to you. She just got you a little special bonus gift because she really likes you. And when you get that gift, what do you think? Oh. <laughs> I shouldn't ask you to be, you don't have to be totally transparent. When we get that gift, we think to ourselves, I gotta go shopping. Like, I gotta go buy something for them so that we're even. When I asked my high school kids this last year, I said, what do you do when somebody gives you a gift? They said, I look for the receipt at the bottom of the box. Right? Because they want to get the gift that they want. They don't want the gift that their parents got them. The son doesn't do any of that. All he does is say thank you. All he does is receive. Right? And he receives all that the father gives to him. He receives all. And if we put language on that receive all, I'm going to use the word entrusts himself to the Father. Right? He entrusts his life to the Father. Which means he has this relationship with the Father where he knows that the Father wants his good and therefore he places himself into the Father's hands on the cross, Jesus says. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. In his public ministry, Jesus says, whoever sees me sees the Father. Don't you know that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The Father and I are one. He entrusts his life to him. He doesn't do anything apart from the Father. And then there's this other kind of love, this third person of the Holy Trinity, which is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. So when we talked about that covenant God created with man at creation, we said that there was this relationship that existed between them by the very fact that God created man. And so the Holy Spirit is that relationship between the Father and the Son that has existed from all eternity. It's the bond of love between them. And then Pope Benedict says, if we want to ask ourselves, who is the Father? The Father is a being for the Son. Right? The person who loves by giving is a being for the other person. The Son is a being from the Father. Jesus is sent by the Father. He's the being from the Father. If you ask Jesus who he is, he's going to start pointing you back to the Father. He doesn't have an identity in himself. His identity always lies in the Father because it's his origin. Right? Our identity is about our origin. That's why John Paul II pointed us back to our origin. And the Holy Spirit is a being with the Father and the Son. Right? He exists between the two persons. And so Pope Benedict says that according to his theology of love, when God created us in his image, he created us in the image of all three of these persons. Right? When I used to teach this class, I would start with this Trinity diagram I have on the slide, and then I'd move straight to this idea of man and woman and a child. Right? and say the family itself is the image of the triune God. And we can still say that. But what Pope Benedict is doing is something different. He's saying that an individual person is always a being from, a being with, and a being for. An individual person is always a son or a daughter who grows to become a husband or a wife in order to become a father or a mother. We're all a son who becomes a husband who becomes a father or a daughter who becomes a wife to become a mother. And when we talk about love and as we go through the theology of the body audiences, I want to kind of refer back to this structure because 
relationally, I think it's a better structure. And that means that our core identity is to be a son or daughter. And that state of original solitude that we've just talked about, how Adam discovers that he's the partner of the absolute, that he's not like any of the animals, that he is the only one in creation who's like God, that his origin is God. What he discovers about himself is that he's a son. He discovers that he's a son. And then we're going to talk about how this next sort of line comes. It's not good that the man be alone. I'll make him a suitable partner. And then he encounters his spouse so that he can then love as a husband or he can love as a father. When God created Adam, this whole relational dynamic in the Trinity then becomes visible in the world. You have this relationship between God and Adam. God wants the good for him. And Adam, in turn, entrusts himself to God. Okay, when John Paul II talked about how he finds himself like within this choice, right? This choice between immortality and non-existence, right? That choice or that tension, it's always there. It's a place where he lives out his sonship in that choice. In all of us, we have that same kind of freedom to live out our sonship. Whenever we're faced with a choice to love or to not love, it's this choice that we have to live out our sonship or our daughterhood. And when this happens, everything is good. And then we move into that second story of creation. Tonight, I'm going to cut short and do some admin. I'm going to try to go from 7 to 8.30 as we meet. Um, So I hope you don't feel gypped. Um, And it's also snowing. Um, So an admin announcement is this. like We're going to pick up on original unity next time. So for next time, um, we just did audiences one through seven. So I want to orient you to the book. So those of you who have the book, okay? So in the beginning of the book, you've got Michael Waldstein's introduction, which is very long and dense philosophically. So if you're feeling, if you're feeling motivated, go ahead and read it. All right. The first audience starts on page 131 in the book, okay? And we did through audience seven today, which is on page 153. All right, typically we're gonna do about 10 a week. Okay, so the next class I will make audience eight through 18. So audience 18 is going to take you through page 201, okay, which is about, it's less than 50 pages, okay, through page 201. And so that's what we'll do for next week.